thanks to earlier detection and much better treatment options, cancer today is more survivable than ever. But we are still a long way from curing cancer across the board for all forms of cancer. If you caught my podcast from several episodes back on improving cancer survival with diet and lifestyle choices, I covered the broad lifestyle habits linked with improving cancer survival odds. I also touched briefly on many of the so-called cancer cure diets that are bound on the internet. So for this podcast, I'm going to home in on one that is getting a lot of attention, and that's the ketogenic diet. Ketogenic diets are just one of an endless variation of low-carbohydrate, high-fat diets that are currently popular for weight loss. Designed to restrict carbohydrates to such a low level that greater amounts of ketone bodies, which are metabolic byproducts from fat metabolism, so you get more of these ketone bodies produced to fuel the body. But a bit of digging around on the internet will also find claims that keto diets are being promoted as a cancer cure diet. This link can be traced back to the 1920s and the observation by Nobel Prize winning physiologist Otto Vorberg, who observed that cancer cells take up more glucose than healthy cells. And they convert this glucose via glycolysis to lactic acid. Now, this characteristic of cancer cells has been called the Warburg effect. And a fun fact side detour here, knowledge of the Warburg effect resulted in the development of the widely used cancer detection method called positron emission tomography, or a PET scan. The PET scan uses radioactive isotopes of glucose with the knowledge that cancer cells exhibit higher rates of glycolysis and glucose metabolism, so this helps pinpoint tumors using advanced imaging tools. So back to keto and cancer. Because cancer cells take up and metabolize more glucose than normal cells, it has been speculated that reducing carbohydrate intake and thus reducing glucose availability in the blood may help prevent or treat cancer. Although I should add here that even protein contributes to blood glucose and even an all-fat diet will still result in adequate glucose in the bloodstream as the body can make glucose from other sources internally. So there is the theory and then the reality of what may happen as you can't really starve yourself of glucose or you'd be dead. Another possible mechanism by which carbohydrate restriction and specifically a ketogenic diet might slow down cancer growth is through the generation of ketone bodies. So there is some evidence that many cancer cells, unlike normal healthy cells, cannot use ketone bodies as an energy source. So this again could help deprive them of a fuel source for their growth. And it has even been postulated that a ketogenic diet could slow down angiogenesis. So angiogenesis is the generation of new blood supply. So in this case, it could help deprive a tumor of the nutrients it needs to grow from restricting its blood supply. But is there merit in trying to keep blood glucose levels down to help reduce the fuel available for cancer cells? Most of the evidence for this has been from rodent and cell culture studies. And the results have been mixed, with some studies showing an anti-tumor effect from a ketogenic diet, while also helping to augment chemotherapy drugs to work better. Yet other studies find that a keto diet actually promotes cancer progression, as is the case with cellular models of melanoma. One recent review of the preclinical studies in this area, which I'll link to in the show notes, found that 60% of the preclinical studies reported an anti-tumor effect of a ketogenic diet, but 17% of studies did not detect an influence on tumor growth, and concerningly, 10% of studies reported adverse or pro-proliferative effects on tumor growth when using a ketogenic diet, at least in animal and cell culture models. 
So it may depend on specific tumor characteristics, whether a ketogenic diet will be of benefit or of harm. And some of this research also highlighted the importance of optimizing the composition of the ketogenic diet to enhance its efficacy by increasing the proportion of fat or supplementing with medium chain triglycerides or omega-3 fatty acids. And since most of this preclinical research is in animal models involving grafting of tumors, they are very removed from human physiology. So it certainly should make any person take heed that the effect of low-carbohydrate diets on cancer is by no means universally positive and in some cases can be harmful. We are still a long way from knowing how this all plays out in humans. But most preclinical and some clinical studies do support the use of the ketogenic diet as an adjuvant cancer therapy that could be used in some situations to support current treatment protocols. There have been, though, very few studies of ketogenic diets for the treatment or prevention of cancer in humans outside of a few pilot or case studies with a small number of subjects, so we still need larger randomized control trials. Nevertheless, consistent findings from the research include a moderate reduction of blood glucose levels and induction of ketosis, which is hardly surprising, as we already know that's what a ketogenic diet does. But it does point to the feasibility and tolerability of using a keto diet in this patient group. But this is by far from universal, with common reports in some studies of low adherence to the diet because of either poor tolerability associated with nausea, fatigue or constipation, or because patients stop the diet because of tumor progression. So it's not a glowing report card for the diet in all cases. But then again, such symptoms are common in many people with cancer, regardless of the diet followed. And putting all this clinical research together in one place, a recent systematic review has just been published in the last few weeks, which I'll link to in the show notes. The review looked at any studies that analyzed the use, effectiveness, and potential harm of a ketogenic diet in people with cancer of any age when used as either a sole or complementary therapy. Showing just how small the research field is, even though 46 studies were identified, a total of just 770 patients were studied. So that's a lot of small studies and case reports in the research field. And only three of these studies were a randomized control trial design. And of note, in these three randomized control trials, they found a greater amount of weight loss in those people on the ketogenic diet which is actually not a positive finding in a cancer group, considering the big issue of unintentional weight loss and malnutrition in people with cancer undergoing active treatment. And even with the small amount of research included in the systematic review, it was only in just one single study where it was possible to make a call if a ketogenic diet improved survival. And even then, It was just in a subgroup of patients with breast cancer, but the results were favorable. But it is a big understatement to say that we really can't extrapolate a conclusion from one well-controlled study that had to drill down into a subgroup of patients to see any benefit as some form of endorsement for this diet. I am always super cautious with research papers that can only report on positive findings from a subgroup of patients. Because if you slice and dice your data up enough, it is possible that some significant findings will just come up by chance. In the observational studies included in the review, only five studies met the grade that you could really assess if there was a likely survival benefit of a ketogenic diet in people with cancer. Two of these studies found no benefit. Two found a small benefit, and one study reported a worse outcome on cancer survival with a keto diet. Hardly a ringing endorsement for those promoting such diets as a cancer cure-all. Just stop it. 
If it really worked that well, then even the small amount of research covered in this review should be clearly detecting a big survival benefit with a keto diet. It did not. And here was the conclusion of the review, which I'm going to read verbatim from the paper. There was no conclusive evidence for anti-chimmer effects or improved survival. The majority of patients had significant weight loss and mild to moderate side effects. Adherence to the diet was rather low in most studies, due to the very heterogeneous results and methodological limitations of the included studies. Clinical evidence for the effectiveness of ketogenic diets in cancer patients is still lacking. Now, several clinical trials to further expand on the evidence base for the effect of a ketogenic diet in people with cancer are currently ongoing, and the results from these trials will be essential to further evaluate the feasibility of a keto diet in clinical practice. Some of the strongest case reports of keto's possible benefits have come from glioblastoma, which is a very aggressive form of brain cancer, but it doesn't seem to work that well on other types of brain cancer. And here we are still talking about case reports, which is just code for anecdotes. There needs to be a lot higher levels of evidence published before there could be a case to recommend this diet, even in specific types of brain cancer. It is by no means a bust for this diet, only that the hype is well in excess of the reality. But there is a possibility that a keto diet may be effective in some patient subgroups and for some types of cancer. Until then, get your advice on diet during cancer treatment from those directly working in the area, such as oncologists and clinical oncology dietitians, not from overhyped stories on the internet promising a miracle cure for cancer with keto. If the evidence was there to support such claims, I would happily join the Keto Cheer Squad. So just to finish off today, I want to take a slight tangent to keto diets in cancer and mention the related but not identical area of fasting during cancer treatment. Fasting is like a keto diet on steroids, as it removes all external fuel sources from the body. And there is some absolutely fascinating work being done, looking at how fasting during chemotherapy could improve treatment by promoting cellular regeneration, repairing DNA damage, and reducing side effects like nausea and vomiting. It's very early days for this research field, but this is an area I'm watching with great interest because the very small amount of human clinical research so far points to fewer treatment-related side effects and hints of increased efficacy of chemotherapy using periods of short-term fasting done under medical supervision. So if you want to delve more into this area, I've linked to a review paper from 2020 on the topic in the show notes. So that's it for today's show. You can find the show notes either in the app you're listening to this podcast on if it supports it or else head over to my webpage at thinkingnutrition.com.au and click on the podcast section to find this episode to read the show notes. If you find this podcast of value, then please consider sharing it with your friends and colleagues, or maybe even leave a review. This all helps increase the ranking and reach of the podcast, which means a big win for credible, evidence-based nutrition messages while helping to dilute out the crazy and making the world a slightly less confusing place. I'm Tim Crow, and you've been listening to Thinking Nutrition. Thinking Nutrition.